Um, we've seen some uh, remarkable 100 years of growth in technology, uh, starting with airplanes, the introduction of space flight, related technologies that make up our aerospace community. Michigan Aero has been at the forefront of teaching research and service now for over for 100 years, and we plan to be leaders in aerospace enterprise for the next 100 years. And we hope you will keep track of us and um, <clears throat> keep involved with this. Many of the people who made the past so wonderful are here tonight. In particular, I'd like to recognize our emeritus faculty. And so if you would stand as I read your name, and if I forget to read your name, then you don't have to make a donation this year, so. <clears throat> Uh, Tom Adamson. <laughs> Harris McClamrock is over here. Let me see, Elmer, I saw Elmer someplace. Elmer Gilbert. Oh, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Isley. Mm -hmm. Bob Howe, I guess he was at the, res oh, there he is back, is Bob here? No, okay. Um, Art Nichols, Bill Anderson, oh, there's Bill, okay. <laughs> the people who aren't here and were on my list will have to make donations. Um, and past faculty member, Bill Kaufman, it's Bill, Bill Kaufman back here in the corner. We also have two former chairs here, um, Harris and Tom, Harris McClamrock and Tom Adamson. So I have to tell a little story about Tom. I interviewed for this job in 1990 and Tom didn't give it to me, so. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to recognize, recognize Ben Macchiano, who's been, I saw him walk by someplace, right here, um, for serving as our rapporteur this week and for also arranging for the F-35 simulator. Um, and a not so recent alum, Corey Booker, is over here in the corner, who you heard from earlier for arranging the uh, Orion simulator and displaying a Duderstedt Center on North Campus and of course for the flag, which is over here. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Munson for his leadership. <clears throat> leadership of our college for giving me the job that Tom wouldn't give me. <clears throat> and in particular, for support of the aerospace department in general, and in particular, this event. We really appreciate that, Dave. So we'll <clears throat> So we have what I think is our oldest alum with us, sitting at the table in front of me here, is Robert Richman. He uh, recently wrote a book and was kind enough to send it to me, making me both aware of himself and of the book, called uh, uh, Life in Canadian Aerospace, 1942 to 1992. <laughs> Robert graduated in 1942. Last, I'd like to thank all the alums in the room for making Michigan Arrows outstanding reputation. It's really due to you, your wonderful achievements, your personal successes. So thank you very much for both coming back and for being such great people. So a round of applause for me. So to round out our alumni dinner, I thought it would be fun to hear from, from three generations of alums. A little hard to do in some cases. But fortunately, we uh, have Bill Chen with us, William Chen, uh, Major General Chen, retired, of course. Um, <clears throat> he's going to speak to us to represent his generation. Paul Adams over here is going to speak to us about uh, his experience. And um, Bill is also going to tell us about his dad, who was a um, 1932, I believe, graduate. And um, this will be pretty interesting. So let me first introduce Bill. Um, he got his uh, BS degree in math in 1960 and then came to the right side and studied aero and got an aero degree in 61. 
In 89, he was the first Chinese American to wear a two-star rank of major general in the U.S. Army. He was assigned to commanding general of the U.S. Army Missile Command, Redstone Arsenal, Alabama, from 89 to 92, fulfilling a career-long ambition to command there. Uh, Chen's military career focused primarily on the development of program management and procurement and support of Army missiles, weapon systems, and air and missile defense systems. His interest and passion to work in guided missiles and rockets began where? Here in his sophomore year at University of Michigan, like many of us um, inspired to work in the aerospace industry. Little did he know that 32, later, 32 years later, he would be in command of the U.S. Army Missile Command, uh, which later was redesignated Army Ballistic Missile Agency. During the operation of Desert Shield and Desert Storm, the largest deployment and subsequent combat use of missiles in the Army's history, Chen directed um, the, the, the support for all missile systems deployed in that theater. Bill's father, Moon Chen, also graduated from U of M, Arrow, in 1932. This is an inspiring story, which I have a great pleasure to read about recently, about two generations of Arrow alum, and I'd like to invite Bill up now to say a few words about his father's career and his legacy to his son. Bill? I'd like to talk about three major influences in my father's life. But before doing that, just a little bit about my father. He was a pioneer in China's new frontier of aviation. From the mid-1930s on through to the 1970s, he contributed to the buildup of China's civil aviation as a pilot and as an airline executive and its military aviation as a U.S. Army Air Corps officer in the 14th Air Force Flying Tigers. He later played a key role in the introduction of jet aircraft manufacturing. The first major influence on his life was his Michigan education. He repeatedly attributed his Michigan education to have opened opportunities for him. And he wanted to serve his alma mater. As president of his alumni club, he hosted many delegations from the university, including the university president, and he actively promoted and enhanced the prestige of the university. In 1958, he very much treasured receiving the Distinguished Alumni Service Award. Born in Columbus, Ohio, he was a Buckeye by birth, <laughs> but his allegiance was always to Michigan. His three sons are all Michigan graduates. And let me divert here. Let me divert here and mention that uh, here at this reunion, I have two of my 1960 classmates, Roy Nichols and Dick Young. Of course, Dick and I used to have a full crop of hair. Now we go to the same barber, sh barber shop. The second major influence in my father's life was being a pilot. Being a pilot gave him self-confidence through the tough years of the Depression. He wasn't able to get a job in aeronautical engineering when he graduated in 1932, but that didn't deter him. Earlier this afternoon, we heard a lot about passion, and so my father did have a passion for flying. He saved up enough money for flying lessons and got a commercial license. In those days, piloting an airplane was a unique skill, even more rare for an American of Chinese origin. My father flew single engine, open cockpit biplanes for the US mail service, and then went to China in 1936 to fly for an airline, an affiliate of Pan American Airways. Later, he was a pilot for the Central Aircraft Manufacturing Company, abbreviated as CAMCO. This company supported General Claire Chenault and the American Volunteer Group, the original Flying Tigers. 
In fact, Camp Goal was the company of record for those Flying Tiger pilots that first went to China. And of course, on their employee card, they were classified not as pilots, but as farmers. General Chenault was classified as a farmer, uh, as an example, and others were uh, other occupations. My father helped to establish a plant for assembly and repair of P-40 aircraft at Loy Wing, China, near the China-Burma border. And the Flying Tigers used that airfield there as a base for some initial operations in the Sino-Japanese War. A third major influence was my father working for General Chenault while assigned to the 14th Air Force Flying Tigers during World War II. As a captain, my father was, a, was General Chenault's liaison officer and personal representative to the Chinese Air Force. After World War II, he continued working for General Chenault in the airline that General Chenault founded. And the airline was really founded with the use of surplus C-46s and C-47s. And uh, some of you may know, but the uh, C-46 used a Pratt & Whitney engine, the R-2800 uh, double wasps. Working for General Chenault, my father developed leadership skills that led to his becoming an airline executive, serving as an area manager, helping transform from a cargo carrying to a passenger carrying aircraft, and expanding routes in the Far East, becoming director of traffic sales, and later vice president for sales and marketing. Later, he played a key role with Northrop Aircraft Co Company to introduce jet fighter aircraft manufacturing in the Republic of China. Now, I would be remiss talking about my father without mentioning my mother, his bride for over 71 years. She lived to 97, he lived to 101. So imagine an American-born Chinese who didn't speak Chinese very fluently, seeking consent to marry my mother's father, a university president, while at the same time, their family considered him a chauffeur, an aerial taxi driver. Now, it was only later did people realize that during the war, airlift over the hump provided a lifeline to China. And after the war in peace, cargo carrying aircraft delivered supplies for reconstruction and relief and passenger carrying aircraft resulted in tourism and leisure travel, all leading to economic development, investment, and trade. For my father's journey in China's aviation frontier, my mother was his navigator, helping him negotiate through social, language, and cultural issues. Lovingly, my father referred to her as his chief of staff. On his deathbed, my father personified his life as a pilot, airman, and flying tiger. His last gesture was an aviator's thumbs up signifying all is well. And this thumbs up gesture was widely used by hump pilots and flying tiger pilots in the China Burma India theater. Thumbs up has a special meaning. Thumbs up in Chinese also means ding hao or the very best. I'd like to close by saying, if he were here tonight, my father would say two things. One is go blue. <laughs> and second is ding hao. Thank you very much, Bill. That was wonderful. Last, I'd like to introduce a more recent graduate, Paul Adams. Um, most, of, most of you know Paul, who are on the faculty here in the emeritus faculty. Paul received his BS in Arrow in 1983. Um, he became president of Pratt & Whitney on January 1st this year. Under his leadership, Pratt & Whitney is manufacturing engines 
with geared turbofan technology for Airbus, Bombay Air, Embraer, Erkert, and Mitsubishi, and is the sole provider of the uh, F-135 engine for the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning fighter, which you could have driven yesterday or today, courtesy of uh, Ben. We have a nice simulator in our tech center. Uh, prior to being named Pratt & Whitney president, uh, Paul served as the company's chief operating officer, leading to unified operation strategy and ensuring the readiness of the company's global supply chain. He has more than 30 years of leadership experience in program management, engineering, with extensive global experience in aircraft engine industry. Prior to becoming chief operating officer, he was senior vice president for operations and engineering for a combined seven years, leading new product development, technology strategy, manufacturing operations, and supply chain management. He joined Pratt & Whitney in 1999 um, from Williams International, which I think was your first job, right? Is that here in Michigan. Um, in 2013, Paul was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, a great achievement, um, specifically for leadership and innovation for gas turbine engines. He's also completed Stanford's executive program. Um, Paul, come on up and give us a few words. Thank you, Dan, and uh, it's, it's great to be back in Ann Arbor, uh, great to be amongst friends. Um, it's also great to celebrate a 100-year anniversary of the Aero Engineering at, at uh, University of Michigan, which is an incredible accomplishment. By the way, it is the first uh, engineering organization to teach aerospace engineering anywhere in the world. I say that because uh, in a few weeks, MIT will be grad uh, uh, celebrating their 100-year anniversary also. So that's a different point altogether. But uh, Michigan has a tremendous legacy in aero engineering. It starts back in uh, 1914. The first class that was taught was the theory of aviation. It was a two credit hour class. And it was really taught by uh, Felix Pawlowski, who was really the father of aero education in America. In 1912, uh, Felix Pawlowski, he contacted a number of universities about the possibility of teaching an aerodynamics class, an aeronautics class. And uh, two of the universities responded. It was uh, MIT and Michigan and uh, MIT later had to turn them down because they didn't have the funds. So, um, so it is true that Michigan was the number one and it was Felix Pulowski who actually was the, the innovator who brought uh, aerospace engineering and uh, aerospace education to the US um, that we celebrate this 100 years for. Now, Pulowski was a unique individual. He was a mechanical engineer, he was a student at the uh, University of Paris, and while he was in Paris, he actually got to witness a early demonstration of flight by the Wright brothers. And uh, he was hooked. Now, the Wright brothers actually taught a class in how to fly, but uh, he couldn't afford it. So uh, being creative, he actually somehow managed to get one of the early monoplanes and actually taught himself to fly with no uh, lessons whatsoever. So pretty creative type of guy. He also uh, studied in the first aerodynamics class, the first aeronautics class taught, which was taught at the University of Paris. But in uh, 1910, he decided to come to the US and become an, uh, a, um, an auto designer. And he worked for the auto companies for a couple years, but he still had this passion for aeronautics and aer aerodynamics. So he, um, he wrote the universities. And in 1913, Dean Cooley hired him for, uh, as a teaching assistant. And he hired him as a teaching assistant to teach this new curriculum, aeronautics for a total of $800 a year. So uh, I think we got a bargain on the deal. <laughs> um, but you know, you think about this, you think about the relevance in history. This was, uh, you know, th this was 1914. The Wright brothers flew in 1903. Uh, 1903 flight, it was a great accomplishment, but we have to put it in perspective. It lasted 12 seconds and it was 120 feet long. By, by 1914, aeronautics had moved to the point where they'd actually achieved the first commercial uh, uh, aircraft flight. The commercial, first commercial aircraft flight was actually the St. Peters, Petersburg to Tampa airboat line, which flew a 26-mile uh, flight, flew one person from St. Petersburg to Tampa and back and forth. And that was, that was aviation. That was commercial aviation in 1914. So you think about that in the context of how early and how innovative that was. Now, Today, you know, you think about how far we've gone in 100 years. You know, 26-mile flight, single person. 
in uh, this year, we'll actually have three billion passengers will will get on commercial airlines and fly today, and it really has changed the world. Uh, you think about it, uh, we can pretty much go from any city to any city in the world within 24 hours. Now, I won't guarantee your luggage will get there, but I absolutely guarantee that people can have that happen, and uh, that's good. Um, now, also, despite the fact that the Wright brothers were American and the first powered flight occurred in the U.S., the U.S. was not really a pioneer in this field. And uh, just as a reference point, in 1914, the U.S. military owned 23 airplanes. Now, the French government owned 1,400, the German government owned 1,000, the Russian government even owned 800. So um, we were sort of backwater, but the emergence of education and aeronautics in the U.S. really took us forward. And if you think about that, uh, that's pretty incredible. Now, the first degree, now I did, did some research here. The first degree that was awarded by the aero engineering department, or by, sorry, by engineering department for an aero degree was actually awarded in 1917 to William Gernhardt. And uh, William Gernhardt is famous for being the first person to earn an aero degree. <laughs> as far as I can tell, he wasn't that good an engineer. I, I know this because of the work of another great uh, and accomplished engineering graduate from University of Michigan, that's Sergey Brin, the guy who helped invent Google. So <laughs> this is how you get all answers to all questions. Um, but I did, I did actually do a little research on this, and what I found was, was there was actually some airplanes that William Gernhardt designed. One was this, uh, have you ever seen the old airplane that looked like a Venetian blind? It was a whole bunch of airfoils stacked on each other. I, I remember watching this as a kid in a movie because it goes about seven feet and then it collapses on itself. That was his. <laughs> it's true. Okay. So, but the concept of creating, uh, creating an aeronautics program was really quite visionary and it was really quite important to America. If you think about from 1914 with this slow start, 23 airplanes, really we're, we're, we're not a, a, a leader in aeronautic technology, but because of the emergence of aeronautics programs like the Michigan program, like the MIT program, uh, the United States actually became a, a leader and um, you know, Michigan itself has graduated over 6,000 engineers over its history in the program. And they, they've gone off because of the strong academics that Michigan's always had. Uh, we've turned out some tremendous engineers, industry leaders, pilots, astronauts, um, and a lot of people who really pursued other things but also accomplished great things. It was a great education and it really served uh, the country great and uh, it also served the university quite well. Now, with that said, I think there are actually two individuals, two uh, graduates, two alumni that I would actually like to recognize, and this is arbitrary because I get to pick. Uh, the first is Kelly Johnson, and Kelly Johnson was a graduate of the class of 1932. He was the founder of the uh, legendary Lockheed Skunk Works, and he is uh, considered by many pro people to be the greatest airplane designer of all history, and I, I truly believe that. Uh, airplanes he designed, P-38, C-130, the F-80, the F-104, the U-2, the SR-71 Blackbird. These are airplanes that still have records today. Uh, incredible. And uh, they're airplanes that change history. You think about it, the Cold War remained a Cold War as a result of the capabilities that were defined by the airplanes that Kelly Johnson built. And so we all owe him a great service of gratitude for that capability. The second person I would like to recognize is um, Francois Xavier Bagnon, who is the person that the engineering building at uh, the Aero Engineering Building is named for. And um, Francois was actually a classmate of mine. Uh, I was a uh, graduate in 82, he was a graduate in 83. And I will tell you that um, Francois was the guy that you really just wanted to hate. I mean, he was smart, he was good looking, he was charming, he came from a wealthy family in Europe. And the girls, I mean, they all just went gaga over him. I mean, they went crazy. Now, admittedly, there were only five girls, but still, they went crazy. They did, they went crazy. But, but you, really couldn't, you really couldn't hate the guy because he was a nice person and because he just very naturally fit in with the, just one of the guys. He fit into the community. And you could really kind of see the fabric of the community that we had at the time was really it was fun, it was engaging, it was smart, it was collaborative, and Francois fit in perfectly. And um, 
So tragically, Francois died in a helicopter accident in 1986, uh, support of the Perry de Dakar rally, a helicopter crash, he was killed. But his parents, in his honor, found the uh, Francois Xavier Bagnon Association, and it was, it was dedicated to keep his personal passion alive. And uh, the goal was to bring about peace and security in the world by focusing on children, youth, and women. And if you look at the website for the Francois Xavier Bagnon Association today, that's what it says. But his biggest passion was aviation, and his biggest passion was Michigan aviation. And so the first real big donation that the FXB do uh, Foundation gave was to the aeronautics department. And it was a new aero building, it was graduate fellowships, it was an endowed chair, and, um, you know, it's incredible today to think that his parents felt the passion that he had for Michigan aviation in such a way as to honor his memory like this. And that really goes to tell you about the culture of what was created, what is created in Michigan engineering. And it's a tremendous legacy. And if you look today, the Francois Xavier Bagnon Association still exists. And it is a worldwide organization that promotes public health, human rights, women's rights around the world. And it really is a great testament to the culture that we created here at, at Michigan that his family would honor him in that way. And um, so that's a little bit about history and a little bit of a couple of grads. Um, but we all have our own history. And uh, each of us, you know, understand how our, our history, our own history fits in with U of M. So I wanted to just take a few moments and talk about how my history at U of M fit in. I, I, uh, I enrolled in U of M in the Aero Department in 1981. I was a transfer student. I uh, had done my first two years of school at the University of Waterloo in Canada, a very good school, but uh, I wasn't enjoying myself. I didn't, didn't feel it, and I needed a change. And I was also passionate about aviation, and always was passionate about aviation. And from the time I got to Ann Arbor, I loved the place, and I had many great memories. And I'll share a few of those memories. Um, and, you know, I'll say that when I share them, they'll be broad. Um, so one of my best memories about my time in Ann Arbor was actually waking up, and I had a routine on Saturday morning. A couple of my friends, we'd get together, and we would make pancakes, and we would watch the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour. And, and we love this. We would be laughing our butts off, and people would walk by and just think we were insane. It was great. It was awesome. Now, the thing that actually made that a little bit better is, is on Friday night, we had a competition to see who could buy the cheapest case of beer. And we would rotate, and, you know, we'd, we'd keep tracks of, you know, how much the beer cost and what you did. And, by the way, the winner was a case of Rhinelander, which went for $2.37, which is pretty impressive, actually. It also helps explain why we watch Bugs Bunny Roadrunner and had pancakes Saturday morning. <laughs> now, I also remember Dean Quackenbush calling me into his office and telling me I couldn't take any more technical classes. I had taken too many technical collectives, I was done, and I needed to take some humanities classes, and well, so I signed up for theater classes. And uh, I admit it, I did it to meet girls. Let's say Francois took the other five. So, <laughs> um, it kind of worked. But, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I can, I can stand in front of a crowd nowadays because of that fact, so it's not so bad. Now, it wasn't always easy. Um, you know, I do remember actually missing a mandatory meeting that Harm Juning had once, and um, I admit it, I slept in. It was, it was bad, but, you know, you didn't miss Harm's mandatory meetings. I actually had to go to his office every day for two weeks to let him, to finally break him down to let me in his class. So he, he finally did and I ended up with a pretty good grade. Um, later, you know, I, I remember almost dropping out because uh, I couldn't afford it. You know, I was an out-of-state student. Michigan was very expensive, and uh, very much to their credit, uh, Professor Kaufman and Professor Nichols took great sympathy on me, and they gave me a job in their lab as a lab assistant in the gas dynamics lab making detonation, uh, detonation explosions. And I probably wouldn't have made it other with, without having that opportunity. And um, also, you know, to the credit, when I didn't have a place to go on New Year's Day, Professor Kaufman invited me over to his house, watch the football games with him. And I always really appreciated the kindness that Professor Nickel and Kaufman and the team at the Gas Dynamics Lab had for me. It was really part of the, the community that we developed at Michigan. It was what you did for your people. You helped them out when they were in need. And I really felt like they did, and honestly wasn't sure if I would have made it otherwise. 
So I'm very grateful for the kindness of uh, Professor Nichols and Kaufman, and it's also great to see that Professor Kaufman's joined us tonight. I, I love my time at Michigan. I, I had a great education. I made great friends. Uh, and I found out what it was like to be something bigger than, you know, something bigger than just myself, being part of a community. And it was a really great feeling. And um, if you look at it today, I've been very fortunate. I've, uh, I've had a great career. I've got to work on some great projects with great people, many in this room. It's great to see friends and also colleagues in this room. And uh, I've also got to see the world. And one of the things that inevitably happens, no matter where I am in the world, I'll be out for a run, I'll be wearing my Michigan shorts, I'll have a hat on, someone will see a Michigan logo. And this has happened to me all over the world. Nagasaki, Japan, Stockholm, Sweden, Palo Alto, California, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Inevitably, someone will see me out there, they'll see the Michigan logo and they'll go, go blue. And, and so what it tells you is, is that community is not just a small group of people, it really is knit worldwide. And it's an incredible thing that uh, we've accomplished. And you think about it, 100 years in the department, we've seen the aviation industry really grow into a very important, very important field of engineering and a very important driver in the economy and the world safety. And, uh, and we've been part of it. And um, it started here at Michigan. And so, you know, in the same way, we need to honor Professor Palowski and you know, William Gerdhardt, even though he wasn't that good a designer, and Kelly Johnson, because he was a great designer, and Francois Xavier Bagnon, and all of us who've made Michigan great. And to all of you, I say go blue, and let's make the next 100 years even better. So thank you very much. Would minimize the amount left for co commercial airplanes. So, so we're hoping that those kind of trades aren't made and there's enough for, for everyone. Everybody can improve their footprint.